Kathy. Um, I can see you're signing in and joining, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Samantha Hooker, and I'll be the moderator for today's Eval Cafe. Uh, as you might know, the CAFE is a long-standing speaker series hosted by the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, our goal with the series is to encourage a deeper dive into all things evaluation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add a link to the chat uh, in just a minute here. That is um, for our mailing list. You can go ahead and sign up for that, and we'll keep you in the loop. We do have a great um, upcoming spring schedule that we'll be ready to share soon, so um, that'll be your first chance to hear about that and sign up for future presentations, um, and we'll hope you'll join us in the future. Before we begin, we like to take a moment to acknowledge the history of the land we're on. Western Michigan University is located on the ancestral lands of the Three Fires Confederacy, which was historically occupied by the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Badawadmi nations, and we honor their stewardship and connection to this land. Today, we're excited to be joined by Corey Smith, Director of Health Equity Evaluation at Corwell Health, and Nathan Browning, Founder and Principal of Kyer Research. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can enter them into the chat. You can also use the reaction button to raise your hand and we can um, handle questions that way. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our presenters. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, um, just give me a second to get my... screen shared. Um, so we're going to talk to you a little bit today about some of the work that we've been doing uh, to evaluate health equity uh, portfolios in healthcare at Corwell Health. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit about ourselves, um, share some contacts with you about Corwell and the work that we are, are doing and, and the work that Nathan and I and the rest of our evaluation team is involved with evaluating. And then talk a bit about this evolution that we've had in thinking about um, how we evaluate portfolios uh, in the context of our organization, uh, some of what we've done over the past year uh, to execute on that and the approach we've taken and uh, where we're kind of going next. <laughs> so I'm Corey, I'm a IDP alumni. Uh, as Samantha said, I'm director of our health equity evaluation assessment and analytics team at Corwell Health. I live in Metro Detroit, was born and raised in Jakarta, not born, no, only raised. I, I, was, I was copying Nathan's uh, next slide template and I did not, no, I was not born. I was born in Boston, uh, raised in Jakarta uh, and never expected to work in healthcare or in any kind of organization like Corwell Health. Uh, I never expected to have a branded uh, PowerPoint template like the one that you'll see today, for example, but here we are. Nathan. Hi, everyone. Nathan Browning. I'm also a WMU alum. Uh, EMR program, I got my master's degree, graduated in 2020. Um, and since then, I've been an independent consultant doing applied research and evaluation work with Corwell Health um, and some other clients as well. Mostly health-related stuff is where I've ended up. Um, I live in Kalamazoo. I, I live in the Oakland Winchell neighborhood, for those of you familiar. Um, but I was born and raised in Southeast Michigan, born and raised both in Southeast Michigan. Um, so I uh, am familiar with that area. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been involved with the university quite a bit, even since graduating. One of the things was I um, presented to nursing students at Western earlier this year, and I kind of ran them through like a crash course in evaluation based on data analytics using sort of the quality perspective that we see in healthcare. Um, so I love, you know, coming back to the university and um, talking about stuff that I feel like it enriches me and I hope I we can share some stuff that enriches you all. Thanks, Nathan. <coughs> so a little bit about Corwell Health. Um, you can see some numbers here. Corwell Health is a new health system uh, which emerged out of the <coughs> merger of what was formerly Spectrum Health in West Michigan and Beaumont Health in uh, Southeast Michigan. And now we are a 21 hospital health system across, uh, well, you can see where in the state uh, with also a, uh, a health plan, uh, priority health health plan 
that covers over 1.3 million people in the state. So it's a large system, the largest system in the state at the moment, um, and is a changing place, uh, a place with lots of of uh, of evolution. Uh, healthcare as an industry is an industry full of change at the moment, um, perhaps even more over the next couple of years. Who knows? We'll see. Um, but Corwell Health also made a commitment in 2020 to advancing health equity and and in our vision statement is a it reads a future where health uh, is simple, affordable, and equitable, right? So we've decided uh, as an organization that it's important of us important enough to us to advance health equity that we need to sort of enshrine that within our vision. and And the pledge that was made in 2020, sort of is around these five things, to foster an internal culture that's diverse and inclusive, increase team member knowledge, skills, and capacity when it comes to health equity, when it comes to delivering culturally competent and responsive care, um, conduct analyses, both of our own internal processes and structures, which may or may not be uh, contributing to inequities, but also to analyze our patient data in different ways so that we can understand where there's disparities and outcomes um, whether there's process, those are process or, or out, whether there's disparities in process or outcome measures. Um, and then also advocate for equity advancing public policy and, and legislation. We'll talk a little bit more about how we do that in, in a couple slides. And then listen to our communities, to our patients, to our team members and act on, on that, Make, making sure that, um, well, trying to make sure that they're a part of the decision-making process. And I would say we do that uh, we try to do that. So we've been on this journey for four years, uh, and some of the things that um, we've had to do in those four years is build this infrastructure and a workforce to advance health equity. So over the last four years, we've restructured our community health teams to become sort of that workforce for advancing health equity within our organization. We've had to reallocate and redistribute budgets to make sure that this work is funded appropriately uh, or as appropriate, appropriately as it can be and craft a strategy for how we're gonna do this work so that we can stay focused and set some priorities about how we wanna move our health equity work forward. So this is the strategy that we have right now um, that emerged over basically 2020, 21 and 22. Um, and uh, our, our, our kind of aspiration is no avoidable gaps in health outcomes or life expectancy. That's kind of our North Star. We wanna make sure that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to live a healthy life and achieve their optimal health. And we have these two primary priorities. One is create a foundation, which speaks to some of that infrastructure work that we need to, we've had to do. But you can see here in these six focus areas, there's sort of more specific statements about how we do that. And on the right, is where we are going to try to, where we are focusing some of our work to improve health and uh, reduce disparities and inequities and outcomes with a heavy focus on maternal and infant health, recognizing though that cardiovascular health and mental health are key contributors to maternal mortality and morbidity. And so this has become kind of our, our core focus area uh, when it comes to making investments in programming and in, in initiatives that are, are meant to move the needle on some of these things and have impact directly on patients and community members. So in our in the pledge slide, there is this idea of advocacy. And this is the other kind of guiding framework that we use. Some of this, this will probably look familiar or relatively familiar to anyone who's sort of been in the public health sphere because it's it's this idea of having this ecological approach to thinking about how we invest uh, resources in addressing health. So we know that we need to do things to meet the immediate needs of individuals and change individual behavior. Um, and that could be, you know, ranging from how we deliver care to patients, but also how we meet social needs of, of people. Uh, we know we need to change our organizational policies, practices, and systems. So those are those organizational determinants that might impact health. And that could be how we uh, make referrals for people who have social needs to community-based organizations, or it could be 
um, how we, whether, you know, how we um, hire uh, relative to people who might have had uh, experience with the justice system in the past. And then we need to make investments in the community conditions that affect health. And you could, if you think about that map, there's a lot of different communities that we are, um, we touch and they all have some different needs and we have different mechanisms for assessing those needs and, and using that evidence to inform those investments. And the, the fourth one is, is really thinking about the social structures. And, and this is sort of the most nascent part of our work uh, and, and is done in collaboration with teams like our gov government affairs team to figure out what is the advocacy agenda and how do the three levels below uh, inform the things and the policies that we need to be advocating for in the context of, of the public's policy sphere, whether it's at the community, state, or federal level. So it's only through really, you know, our theory of change basically is that a, a balanced a balanced portfolio of investments across these four levels is how we're going to move from making individual impact to population impact on some of the inequities that we see in our state. <clears throat> the other thing that we did um, last July of 2023 was form the Health Equity Evaluation Assessment and Analytics Team. It's the HEAT team, we call ourselves, and that's the team that I have the privilege to lead. Uh, I put here our mission statement uh, that we developed which is basically about collaborating with teams, leaders, and communities to make sure that they have the infrastructure, information, and insights so that they can make strategic choices and ultimately drive equitable transformation. And that's kind of how we think about our role um, as a team. And so Nathan is part of the evaluation team specifically, but we have folks on the team who do assessment-specific work as well as analytics work. And the analytics work is really about diving into our patient data, looking at disparities, analyzing that information and producing different kinds of analytic tools for folks to use to track progress. Uh, as part of our restructure, uh, we also are in a good position to influence this work at a strategy, kind of from the strategy level down to the programmatic level. So we report directly to our chief inclusion, equity, diversity and sustainability officer uh, and sit alongside our, our leaders who are leading our community health work in healthier communities, really pushing forward that health equity strategy that I showed, and also support the diversity, equity, and inclusion team, which is really focused on building a culture of belonging and inclusion for team members and patients inside the organization. And in all of this, things have been getting stretchy. And so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about relative to the, the evolution of our team is how we sit alongside those three teams that I just showed on that slide. Those teams have kind of multiple layers of leadership and, and, and staff, and our charge is to be able to support them, right? To develop evaluation structures and processes that can help them from a leader level down to a program manager level have access to the information that they need to really make choices about what they should be doing. And, and so it's been a, it's a challenge for us with limited resources and limited number of FTEs really to, to be able to figure out exactly how we should deploy ourselves, right? And at first, in the, you know, early on, we thought, you know, we're just going to focus on paying attention to the questions that leaders have. Well, over, to, over the last year, Nathan's going to talk to you about some of the work that kind of led us to this conclusion. We also realized that, like, we're never going to have good answers to the questions that leaders have if we don't make sure that that we can answer questions at the program manager level. And so there's this aggregation of information that we have to be able to do. And, and, and where we're at right now is building the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, and so I worry sometimes that um, we're getting overstretched and we're not really going to be able to deliver anything good to anyone uh, because we're going to be trying to serve everyone. Um, I don't think we're at that point yet, and we'll, we'll, we're doing what we can to, to guard against that, but that's the, that's the challenge with the stretchiness. In, I think, April or May of 2023, uh, we found this work, and it kind of changed everything for us. Um, this book... Uh, and and actually originally a webinar that Emily Gates did that we kind of all watched as a team together 
really got us thinking about our role, about the role of evaluation in complex environments or, or situations where, um, where, where, where as evaluators, we aim not only to conduct an evaluation to answer specific evaluative questions about programs, but to actually be able to contribute to systems change and transformation. Um, and so, you know, what Emily and Tom do in this book is kind of provide this contrast between kind of a, a traditional approach to evaluation versus something else, right? And, and we've been trying to think a lot about how we reposition ourselves um, from what Emily and Tom call our kind of judges, uh, evaluators as judges to evaluators as co-learners, uh, respecting sort of the insights and expertise of program staff and, and others who are doing this work to make sure that we come alongside them to help them think critically about what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing, and what they should do next. And so this book and the work of Emily and Tom has been really important to us. And, and a lot of what we do is grounded in trying to operationalize some of what they've articulated in this, uh, in this body of work. And so one of the things that really sits with us and comes up so often, uh, I think in all of, all of our team's interactions with, with folks um, is this idea of evaluation as situated practical reasoning. And, and this diagram, is, it's an adaptation from their book but fundamentally what they're trying to show here is that, you know, by thinking about the way that values and power dynamics influence the generation of evidence and the bringing forward of perspectives to interpret that evidence, we can then answer these kinds of evaluative questions like how did we do, what should we do, and where do we go from here? And so there's a lot of times I find when things can feel overwhelming or uh, the questions that people are asking are incredibly, you know, vague or, or complex or feel like, you know, how would we ever answer that? And, and being able to use this as a touchstone to say, okay, our team, heat team is going to generate evidence, right? Facts of the matter, data. And then what we're going to do is be facilitate dialogues between people about that evidence so that collectively we can come to some answer uh, to some of these types of questions. Because a lot of what we try to do, going back to that mission statement, is, inf is, is that inform that strategic decision making. And, and, and that's really about what do we do now, right? Thinking about what is versus what we think should be, how do we start to move from here to there? And, and that's, that's been the crux of what we've been up to for the past year. And Nathan's going to talk a little bit more about some of those specifics. So I think I'm almost done with the context, but um, the last sort of thing I wanted to say was, you know, we we started off in a situation where you had three regional teams, each of them were executing on a certain number of programs, and each of them had a certain amount of evaluation support. And so what we did was we brought all of that evaluative support together onto one team, which is our HEAT team, to think about how we deliver the right type of support to the right uh, two programs when they need it. We had some people who are doing evaluation in some regions who were heavy on the quantitative skills with people in other regions who were heavy on qualitative skills. And there was a variation in how evaluation was being done and conducted, what it was grounded in, et cetera. And so the coming together to form this single team is a, is a way for us to be able to sort of anchor ourselves in a shared approach and understanding of, of evaluation, talk about that to our colleagues and develop the appropriate structures and processes to support that evaluative work everywhere. Um, we also are trying to move to this portfolio. Uh, oops, sorry. We're also trying to move to this portfolio sort of way of thinking. So we don't wanna just be situated and working within the context of single programs. We want to be thinking about how programs are um, complementary of one another. How you know a maternal infant health program and a chronic disease management program might be brought together because they can advance shared outcomes. And so, what we the way this is taking shape is we have we have regional portfolios, right? We have a port you know different kinds of portfolios in the southwest and east, 
and each portfolio is made up of a collection of different initiatives. And we can set outcomes or identify outcomes at the portfolio level. But then we might also be able to create sort of system-wide or enterprise portfolios. So the enterprise portfolios give us a, a way to look at our collection of investments from a system perspective and understand the progress and the impact that those investments are having on a wider swath of individuals across our, um, our service area. And so this portfolio approach kind of came out of some work we've been doing with a consulting company called Health Begins, which is a organization that works with health systems, Medicaid serving organizations, and other nonprofits to help them move more upstream when it comes to thinking about health. And they've had us thinking about each of the things we do as investments and then those investments being kind of couched within these, these portfolios. And so we've been trying to incorporate this into our evaluation structure so that we can answer questions for different types of audiences, whether it's our chief DEI officer, whether it's a regional leader, whether it's a program manager, um, and so on. And so it's sort of this starting from the base, which is the programs, and then being able to aggregate up different levels so that we can deliver different kinds of insights to the right people at the right time. Um, so the big question has been, uh, are these programs and portfolios focused on similar goals and outcomes? We think probably not. Uh, and, and so we wanted to know how far off we really were from reaching this place where we had well-aligned investments driving towards shared goals that could be aggregated up maybe multiple levels so that we can effectively talk about the impact and value that this work has for an organization like Corewell Health. Nathan. So that leads us to kind of the main uh, project that we undertook to answer that question. And I think we knew um, a, just over a year ago that rubrics would be a useful tool to help us kind of preset some of the information, some of the standards um, to, to sort of know what we are expecting of programs, because we have this sort of enterprise wide and the strategy, you know, we have this kind of big picture view. And so I spent a lot of time uh, at AEA, it was conveniently timed right after we started talking about this. I went to every rubric session that was offered um, at 2023's AEA, um, Jane Davidson, Tomas Chianka, um, and I have to give a shout out to the Evaluation Center as well, because I came in person to uh, when they came after AEA to talk more about rubrics. And I was, you know, I got like an entire page of notes worth. So um, it really spurred a lot of uh, insight and um, design, helped to design this process in a way that was really grounded in best practice. Um, and we did consult other literature. Julian King um, talks about, a lot about rubrics and value, which is another um, perspective we bring into, as Corey has mentioned. Um, the equitable evaluation framework is something we've been heavily grounded in as a team since 2022 and um, have engaged with them uh, as a practice partner. Um, and so, there, and there's a bunch of other things that we pulled from, but these are the big pieces for how we start to approach this rubric design. So we wanted this to be very participatory. We wanted it to have a lot of buy-in from the teams that we'd be going through this sort of rubric with. And so we came up with sort of four preliminary domains of what we thought was important for a program to be aligned with some of the strategies that were coming through at Orwell Health and the health equity strategy teams. And we met with one group of individuals. We were going to pilot this at one region, which is south down in Berrien County. And we met with one group and, you know, we had four sort of mini focus groups that we ran and kind of asked about like if a program was doing really well at this, you know, what would it look like? Can you describe what that would look like? Um, can you describe what, you know, things we might be missing? Um, and so we were focused on things like outcomes and impact. You know, what would it look like if we had really strong outcomes? What would it look like if a program was really strongly aligned with the health outcomes that are in our strategy? Um, and so on. And so using those uh, groups, we were able to apply everything we learned to design a rubric and standards that um, we think does a pretty good job at measuring 
our the program each program's level of alignment with our different strategic frameworks that we have. And so we took this rubric, which you can kind of see in really small print on the right. Um, we uh, we put it into Alchemer, it's a survey tool. Um, put all of the we had kind of four sort of standards that you could pick from, and we didn't want this to be something that was done um, asynchronously or something that was done by one person. We wanted this to be, you know, really living into the um, gathering of perspectives, the generation of evidence in real time and kind of talking about it and coming to a decision. So we hosted these rubric sessions, what we called them, and we would get program teams together. We did a lot in person. We did uh, a few virtual as well. In person always gets richer conversations. So that was um, one, one area that we really tried to hone in on is getting that in person. And we just spent time, you know, going through this. Sometimes we, I mean, it's like three hours at some times uh, taking from program teams to answer each question, you know, writing down supporting evidence and rationale, um, trying to maintain consistency between applications of the rubric between programs. Um, and so we went through these sessions um, to, you know, um, essentially generate all of our data. And there was one other um, element of, data that we sort of pulled from, and this is the next slide, Corey, you can go ahead, um, which were logic models. So we kind of had these, we had the PAR, which is the rubric, and if you hear me say PAR, that's talking about the rubric, portfolio alignment rubric. So we had the PAR and we knew that we were going to, you know, be analyzing our portfolio of programs across the entire enterprise um, based on that. And so we were thinking, what else can we, can we use to kind of inform this? And we found that most programs did have a logic model. There were some different templates and such, but for more or less that we all had a logic model for almost every program. And we were also doing logic model sessions for a lot of programs. This is something that we were just kind of generating in real time. So we had a team basically go through every logic model and pull out the outcomes statements that they had in their logic model and essentially did a qualitative coding analysis of those outcome statements to say, okay, does this, you know, how does this align with our strategic frameworks and kind of the same ways that we asked in the rubric. Um, and so it was kind of a grounded theory type of approach, you know, just generating themes based on what the outcomes were giving us, um, categorizing them and sorting them and really kind of seeing what are our outcomes looking like across you know, disparate regions across disparate types of programs and how are those informing, you know, what we're doing overall. And so ultimately we ended up with two, these two um, uh, data sources, which the logic model analysis of outcomes really spoke to what we aspired to do. A lot of times they're more aspirational. You know, we have all these grand ideas about you know, the long-term outcomes that we're hoping to achieve and um, what we think we can do in the scope of our programs. And then we had these rubric sessions, which we tried to bound very strictly about what we have done in the past. Um, and so kind of these two complementary contrasting methods to um, paint a picture of, you know, our aspirations versus what we've achieved. And so Kind of doing these sessions, we didn't have any sort of formal feedback except for at the end of sessions, we'd say, How did that work for you? You know, we had some pre planned questions we would ask if we had time. Um, but ultimately, spending this amount of time, you know, sometimes three, four, five hours, half days of, you know, detracting from the programmatic work just to kind of reflect. Um, I think the stakeholders that we put through this process would say that this was well worth the time taken, and it's what they told us. Um, and I'll let Corey speak to this quote because he was here for um, when the person said this and I was not. So I'll let you speak to kind of what this meant. Yeah, we had, a, we were in a um, strategic planning meeting with the, the West team and they organized a couple of individuals who had participated in these sessions to come up and talk to everyone else about the experience. And we didn't really know what they were going to say. But one of the things that Scott, who's a regional manager in the West, said was, you know, based on kind of his experience with evaluation and his expectation of what we were coming in to do, he was ready to fight, right? He was ready to fight for his programs. He was ready to fight against 
what he thought was going to be some kind of a, a assessment of their worth uh, in that moment. And and so and and then he said, but you know, pretty quickly uh, through the the conversation, the facilitation, and the framing of what we were actually trying to accomplish, he realized it was just a chance to to think critically about what they're doing in the context of all of this change, right? Because in an organization like ours, there's a lot of levels of hierarchy from top to bottom that communication has to flow about the direction that we're heading. And sometimes that can create some anxiety for program staff because they're wondering, is there gonna be a place for me? Is there gonna be a place for the things that I care about that I've been dedicating my time to, to doing? And so these rubric sessions were a chance for folks to think about what how their work does fit into uh, into some of the priorities that are being or have been established. And so everyone seemed to feel, at least who spoke uh, on this particular day, that this was a chance um, to really reflect, to really think about and be pressed on questions about their work and to emerge with a better understanding about how it does or or may uh, contribute to our broader goals. And so the story that I'll share in some of the feedback, and this was kind of more real time example of self something. So we would run these rubric sessions where we would have uh, an assistant and a sort of lead facilitator. I was sitting as an assistant on this, taking notes, you know, asking clarifying questions, contributing as it made sense. And the one of the questions that we ask in the rubric is somewhat provocative. It basically, the question is, you know, is there another approach program design um, that would be better at achieving the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve? And the program or the um, the rubric sort of coordinator facilitator asked this question, and then the program coordinator, I mean, started to tear up and and basically. It was tense for a moment because we were like, uh oh, what if we we just cracked open something um, potentially bad? But they basically said that they were so proud of the way that their program was going and, you know, how how they had answered, talked about the outcomes that they had achieved that, you know, it brought them to tears and they were so proud of what they'd have been able to accomplish. So it was a, it, and there was multiple different moments that had, like that, where it was people talked, you know, opened up, they were vulnerable, um, and they got to reflect and build trust with us, um, and then be able to have that honest reflection about, you know, how they're doing. And sometimes that was really positive, and sometimes it wasn't, um, and sometimes it was kind of dire. But it, it was, um, it felt as, you know, participants in this process, it felt very real, and um, it felt very authentic. So to speak a little bit about the the two processes, um, just to give you some output metrics or measures well, for- Can I add one thing, Nathan, real quick? Oh yeah, please, go ahead. The other thing, just what Nathan said about being able to build some trust with with us, you know, you know, I showed that like we were, we formed this team out of the collection of different evaluation resources that existed in each of the regions. And so some people were anxious and not particularly happy that it seemed to them like something was being taken from them. And, and then there was all of these new people that were now involved in evaluation that maybe they didn't know, right? And that they didn't yet have a relationship with. And so, you know, that doing this in, in the first year and, and doing these, spending this type of time with folks and, and really listening to, to understand what it is that they uh, get up to each day I think has been also really important for building a kind of a groundwork of relationships for us for the future. So this is what our logic models basically intended to do, right? Um, or I guess they capture what we intended to do. And we did 29 logic models that we reviewed. Um, we had 445 outcome statements that we pulled from those and analyzed. Um, which resulted in 23 different themes of, you know, outcome themes that kind of spoke to what our programs were contributing to. For the rubric, we, you know, and this is again, kind of reflecting on what has happened versus what was aspirational. There were 
Nope, 34. Yeah, sorry. The animations on this. 34 rubric sessions that we conducted. Um, we engaged over 100 team and community members, not just internal. So folks from outside were engaged, ultimately resulting in 34 variables that we were able to analyze. Um, and so one of those variables from the rubric was basically asking about how much time are we spending? Like trying to get at resources, the budget, and like, especially because we're merging and talking about budgets, it's very messy. We're still trying to get a handle on that. Um, and we didn't, we didn't, you know, want to ask. And, you know, there's just a lot of uh, issues around asking about that. But we thought about time spent. You know, this is something that we can look at and say, how can we slice this up and um, try to give us some idea of what's happening in the portfolio? So we asked about how many hours are spent internally and externally and converted this into a full time equivalent, which is FTE, basically a rough estimate of how many full time employees it takes to run a particular program. And the other key variable that came out of the part and that we'll just show you briefly is talking about our health equity strategy um, and what of the health outcomes that we talked about, maternal and infant health, cardiovascular health, mental behavioral health, how, how, how much does this initiative actually um, prioritize that in its activities and so forth? Um, and, you know, these two things combined give us a pretty interesting answer. Um, so before I even talk about the PAR results, the rubric results, this is from the logic model analysis. So if we broke down, you know, how many outcomes did we look at in the logic models and where were they um, focused on as in health outcomes? The most were focused on this maternal and infant health category. Um, this is uh, shortly followed by mental behavioral health and cardiovascular health. And then we had a bunch that were categorized as other, like they didn't fit into any of these three, um, which is problematic when we're trying to strategize and trying to focus and make sure our programs are, are driving impact together. Um, so while we saw this in the logic models, you know, we, in, we intend in our logic models to say we're driving maternal infant health focus in the rubric results, the percentage of sort of full-time equivalent employees was lowest for addressing maternal infant health. So each percentage here is how many FTE, how, what percentage of our total FTEs are either primarily addressing that health outcome, moderately addressing it, tangentially addressing it, or not addressing it at all. And so we had this um, pretty stark mismatch um, between these two. And you can go to the next slide, Corey. We, we sort of have this diverging finding um, that we aspired to do these certain things with our outcomes, and we actually spent the least amount of time doing those things comparatively to what we aspired to do. And so our job was essentially to you know be the convener of the data, of the evidence, and a lot of this was sourced from our teams. And on July 19th of this year, we gave a presentation to the health equity leaders, which included basically the regional directors and their sort of next report, usually managers of programs or managers of some portfolios. And we, you know, we gave this presentation, shared a lot of data um, and kind of just tried to open this window of talking about what misalignment might look like um, regarding our current state of investments of what, what we have going right now. And, you know, we are uniquely situated that we are interfacing with sort of the highest level strategic leaders at Corwell Health, as well as the frontline, you know, staff that are going into the community. And we interface with both of them. And we have this sort of, we feel a duty to kind of share and make sure that everyone is on the same page together. And so on this uh, screen here in the screenshot, you'll see one slide um, just to talk about, you know, one of the uh, results that came from this. And there's more to come probably with this, but in the screenshot here, you you see the slide that talks about, or it's like you see the one big bar graph. So I pulled this out for you so you can kind of see what this is showing. Um, going back to the logic model outcomes, we talked about transformation compass, uh, that map that Corey showed earlier. <laughs> we basically noticed that 82%, overwhelmingly, our outcomes in the logic models are focused on individual level change compared to, you know, addressing policy changes, addressing different community conditions, you know, 
And this is traditionally how logic models are, are done. But we did have examples where there are outcomes not affiliated with some of these, you know, individual sort of level outcomes. You think of like knowledge, attitude, behaviors. There's a bunch of different alphabet soups about how to categorize the outcomes in logic models. Um, so pick your favorite, but that's what, that's one of our big findings. And what it led to, and this was kind of happening independently, but I think this was a catalyst for it, was it led to some budget targets for our teams to kind of um, get that sort of guidance around how much should we really be doing. Um, Corey, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll show the yeah. targets. So we have these targets now where you know, we want, or the, the leadership has said, we want 10% of our you know efforts in our budgets to be focused on individual behavior change. We want 35% to be targeted sort of internally at those policies and practices that are happening at Corwell Health. 35% to be addressing sort of the big community social determinants that we see. And then the last 20%, we're hoping are you know, funneled more into the policy level at, and in our state, you know, even nationally, uh, as well as locally. And so we were able to kind of get these and you know, drive this conversation and drive this um, decision forward as well. Um, and I'll pass it back to Corey to wrap us up. Um, so just kind of where we're headed, you know, I think where we've been trying to go is to to get to, to create evaluation um, to create evaluation that supports the development of strong portfolio level uh, strong portfolios. Right? We we are you know we're arguing that we need strong portfolio level outcomes that um, and and basically to have strong portfolio level outcomes, you need to have strong investments. And again, that was one of the big takeaways from this year was that. You know, whether we like it or not, um, we have to be able to develop the capacity uh, from an evaluation and monitoring standpoint at the programmatic level to make sure that we understand, uh, A, whether the individual investments that make up a portfolio are impactful, and B, to make sure that they have the information that they need to be able to make ongoing improvements um, this isn't about, this hasn't been about just making sure everyone feels good about the state of their program in the context of our emerging strategy. Uh, there are, you know, there, there are going to be choices that have to get made about how we deploy resources. And, and, and that may mean some programs continue and some, uh, some do not. Uh, those are choices that are going to have to be made in the future. But what we want to make sure is that our teams and our leaders have the best information that they can have to make those those decisions. And we want to make sure that we um, that strong. We we also believe that these these strong these for, to have strong portfolio level outcomes, we need to have strong investments uh, that also generate value. And we've been thinking about this concept of value a lot. Um, and and in the in in healthcare and in an organization like ours, value is often thought of in in terms of revenue uh, or a return on investment. And and Nathan mentioned Julian King's work, and we've been di diving into that. But we've also been exploring some um, ways to measure value uh, that go beyond sort of your traditional ROI uh, into something called value of investment and. Um, social return on investment. So we do know that we need to be able to talk about the value of this work in those terms, but also the question that got us going on this value journey was, you know, thinking about who, what is, you know, who gets to decide what's valuable um, when, when we start to make claims about, about value. And so, you know, we feel pretty well positioned as evaluators to facilitate some of that process. And ultimately, to be strategic. I mean, a lot of this first year or this this past year has been about this idea of alignment and about making sure that we're making that about making sure that we we can make good choices about why what we're doing and why we're doing it as we try to organize ourselves and and to Nathan's point, stay focused um, in in a environment where we have limited resources, where there are constant. Um, financial pressures uh, on our organization and, and on our on both our direct organization but also our healthcare system overall 
and and to be able to you know really prove to this organization that investing in this kind of work makes sense you know we've observed that over the last however many years 10 years 20 years this type of work community health health equity trying to address the social determinants it's been a bit relegated to sort of a sideshow in the context of healthcare and that's not just our healthcare organization Healthcare organizations need to invest something in that, right, to maintain their nonprofit status. But what we hope to do through through some of our work, and and this kind of goes to some of that equitable transformation work, is to be able to make the case and generate evidence uh, to support that case uh, for additional investment, right? To say, you know, doing health equity work, addressing patient social needs. Um, changing our internal structures and processes to make sure people have a good, a better experience, regardless of who they are, what they look like, you know, all of those types of things. We have to keep making the case for that um, because, you know, revenue is still the name of the game to some, ex to some extent. And, um, and that's just the, the context that we live in uh, here at Core Well Health. So, so we hope to try to help which hope to help our leaders be more strategic through this type of work. And that's it. So I, I see some questions in the chat. Um, it looks like Nathan, you answered one. I, I, Michael sent one too, but it just came to me. So I'm gonna read it out, Michael, if that's okay. So Michael says, your team is probing, probing logic models throughout the program efforts. How do you identify specific programmatic dimensions of merit? Do these dimensions support administrative objectives, patient perceptions of satisfaction, patient outcomes, et cetera? So I think, um, yes, uh, it's a great question. And one that I think we've, I'm going to go back to kind of, kind of something I was just saying, which is that for a long time, this work has been sitting sort of outside of the regular business. And, and what we are trying to do is bring this work back into the business because we believe that on the one hand, one way to define dimensions of merit is to articulate the ways in which investments in this work and then the execution of it contribute to some of the broader goals that the organization has, right? And, and that, that creates a tension because there are a lot of people who do this work who don't believe that advancing the goals of the organization are what we should be focusing on, right? And 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 so that's fair enough. So I think there's another dimension, which is looking at what we learned through our community health needs assessments, which we do every three years, and, and listening to what the community says that they need with regards to um, you know, to be to be healthier, to to reach their optimal health. And then thinking about the extent to which a the, initi the initiatives that we are are investing in are are doing that, and then you know not only doing that, i.e., are they having the outcomes that we uh, that they should be having, but are they designed in a way to do that, and then are they having the impact that we expect them to have, right? So it's I think you know we've been trying to figure out like there's priorities set from our senior leaders, there's priorities set in middle management there's these different levels of priorities that are being articulated and 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 trying to contribute to figuring out how the things we do connect to that to those priorities has been one of our key questions uh, another question in the chat from Lori, and I, I just want to speak to this uh, question is did you ever find yourselves questioning the accuracy or quality of the logic models and let me tell you we have a whole project planned that is basically just around, I mean, actually we, we started this, we created an outcomes framework that kind of spoke to how we should be writing outcomes in our logic models. Uh, Cause it's kind of like the wild west, honestly, um, uh, in terms of the quality. Some of them we, we got to walk through that with them and kind of design them. Some of them were kind of made by the program teams without evaluation support. Um, so yes, the questioning of the accuracy and quality of the logic models was uh, a huge component of this. And actually in the rubric, 
we ask questions like, are the outcomes realistic to achieve? Um, are these, you know, are these things that based on what has been happening in the program that are, that are something that you still feel confident about you know, being able to say you're making an impact on? Um, so that was a huge, absolute huge component of this for sure. And then Heather um, asked, my health unit is undergoing a project with similar goals, but using a very different process from what you've described. Our timelines seem incredibly tight. I'm just curious how long you spend to scope out, implement, reflect, and get to the decision-making stage in your work. So it took us some time. I would say like we started this idea of a rubric really kind of started to percolate in middle of 2023. Uh, and it was driven by some observations that our team, who who was then working in only the South region, had of just the lack of focus, right? The, this idea that, like, we're just doing all these things out here, and they don't really have, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of intentionality. And so uh, we wanted to craft a, a process for folks to go through to to put some data behind um, that that concept of alignment. So it took us um it took us about six months uh to kind of draft the rubric vet it go through the process that nathan described and then situate it with our leaders because ultimately we needed their buy-in to allow us to spend all of this time with their staff um and you know we happen to be in a moment where again everything's changing all the time but where there was a lot of questions there were a bunch of new leaders who were asking what is it the work my team is doing and how, and, and and is it the right work? And so we were able to position the rubric in as a tool for that, for answering that question. And, and so we, then we spent January through, I don't know, June doing all of this data collection. Um, and then the last, uh, since July, really kind of continuing to facilitate the use of, of these results. So, you know, it, I think we've had the, we've had some, um, yeah, so that's how long it's taken. I don't know if that feels long or short, Heather, to you. Hey, Corey, I'm going to jump in. This is uh, Laura. I'm in the Eval Cafe room. I really enjoyed this presentation a lot. I just love seeing this, like, real-life work described my question there was quite a disparity that you revealed between like the logic model analysis and the um the portfolio analysis that disparity mm -hmm. between like the investment in caring about maternal health and then investing in maternal health and i wonder if you could just expand on uh, or say more about how that was received and the reaction that you got particularly from leadership on that can i, can I talk a little bit about this Corey? yeah go for it so i think this is a, one of the really interesting things. Um, and, you know, if you have training in statistics, you'll know, you know, sample size. I mean, I mean, these are common terms that program teams will use and call up and be like, well, you know, this isn't representative of all the programs. We have to put all the programs through, um, which was true, right? So that was one thing that sort of came up is, you know, this isn't fully representative. The other issue is that um, we had some programs that were, disproportionately overweight in terms of how many FTEs they carry. I mean, we had one program that is like over 90 full-time equivalents. That's almost half of, you know, of what what the total FTEs are. And so, you know, they, they make the case. And this is, a, I mean, this is why we debate, right? The perspectives and, you know, generating evidence and filtering it, cycling it through the perspectives. But the debate is essentially, you know, when we have outliers that way, you know, can we take these extrapolations from the data? And our pushback in general has been, and this is something Gary Moran taught me, um, and it's kind of drilled into my brain is, you know, you don't need statistics if you're looking at the whole population, at least to infer about something. And so when I think about our my at least perspective about this portfolio level analysis, sure, okay, we have a big outlier. And there's a few programs that are big outliers. Most of them are like less than one FTE, so very small. And then there's a few, it's very um, top heavy. 
And so we have these outliers that contribute. At the same time, we know that we are spending our investments disproportionately on these programs to achieve certain outcomes. So while it's like, yes, we, I mean, that's almost the finding is, yes, we are, we are top heavy and we're disproportionately um, investing in these programs. That is, you know, what we're trying to show you. Um, and is that the right thing for us to be doing? Who knows? That's for, that's for all of us to kind of get together and talk about. Yeah. And the rubber is really going to meet the road. Like, cause I think the response is like, oh, okay. We need to make some different choices about how we invest our resources. Uh, but to Nathan's point, we have a bunch of legacy programs that are big and have existed for a long time and they may not be what we should be doing, but are they going to make, are we going to st stop? You know, we all know that like, uh, we all know that evaluation is but one, uh, one thing folks consider when making choices. Right. And, and in some of these cases, uh, the politics of it might be untenable to, 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 ch to make a change. And so I think there was, um, we, we also tried to position this evidence as, you know, not kind of like, it doesn't, it's not necessarily about the precise number, but it's kind of about the directionality. Like this is kind of a theme, right? Uh, we need to invest more in, in this area if we're, if we're really committed to it from a, from an organizational standpoint. And, and so now comes like the hard work to figure out how do we actually make some of those adjustments, even with those targets, Nathan showed, like, how do we start to make some of those adjustments to, to be investing in other levels of, of transformation. So, you know, I think there was, um, I think the reaction was kind of like, oh, this is not surprising necessarily, but also what are we gonna do next? And that's to be seen. So I know Samantha, Samantha, Samantha. Am I okay now? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. I took yeah, over. Funny. That was awful. Um, Samantha had to pop off, pop off at, as host to start another meeting. So if anybody has like a final question, they just want to come off their uh, mute and ask their question. We probably have one time, what time for one more quick question. I have one. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate this presentation. Um, I guess in deference to the old man, rest his soul, I want to ask what he and I talked about a lot before his death, and that is the alignment between um, management goals, you know, he espoused goal three, and how you measure its alignment with community health goals, maybe standard measures um, there, um, and how you might use that alignment or disalignment to communicate with your executives. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a tough one, right? Especially in an organization that's like so KPI oriented, right? It's like at every level of leadership, it's like, we need metrics, we need metrics, we need metrics, right? And so for me personally, like over the last four years, when I joined Coral, first I was like, you know, the hell with all these metrics, right? It's like, they don't, do they really have a lot of meaning? And whether they have a lot of meaning, I mean, ha what is meaning here, right? And 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 what I what I what I started to realize is that in order for us to get the buy-in and support that we need from executives, we needed to have some of this. We had to play the game and speak the language that they were um, that they that that they were used to, right? Right. Now, how do we start to what does it look like to cascade some of those goals down in a meaningful way so that eventually it reaches some of the the program staff or even the the leaders who are who are managing multiple programs so that these things aren't completely disconnected. We started through this process of kind of from the ground up, right, at the program level to try to get to a place where we have a set of goals or outcomes that we can aggregate towards. There's going to be a set of measures or goals that come down too. And these mm -hmm. things are going to meet at some point. They haven't met yet. 
Um, but navigating that is um, is certainly uh, kind of part of what we are wrestling with every day. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. It's time to close out. This is, we'll, we may have another cafe coming up and we'll certainly let you know right now we don't have anything on the books other, uh, so we'll either see you in a couple of weeks or in January. So thanks everybody for joining and Nathan and Corey, thank you so much for a great presentation. Take care, everybody. Thank you.